Um, as I, we approach this topic, I'm certain that uh, the lasers that we have uh, coming forward, I should mention, I do I recently went on the Speaker's Bureau for VizX and want to clarify that uh, before I begin. Um, I, there's no doubt in my mind that we have the lasers to do what we need to do. The question is, can we register the surface that we need to provide onto the surface of the cornea? And is the data that we get from the wavefront systems going to be accurate and something that we're actually going to apply and make things better? That's what we need to uh, pass over to get over these hurdles. Um, optical aberrations, what are they? Whether it's anything that's not a stigmatic image, what is that? Well, to, to obtain a stigmatic image, we need to have a perfect reproduction of the object to the image. And as clinicians, we are typically lumpers. Let me get my pointer here. We're lumpers. We look at all this really exciting stuff, spherical aberration and common, we just talk about irregular astigmatism. The uh, physical opticians, they're a little bit more specific, and so they would be the splitters. And there are many different distortions. I think we're only going to really be treating comma spherical aberration as a distortion. We don't want to, <clears throat> I don't think we're going to be able to treat some of the others, specifically diffraction, which is pupillary limited, and chromatic aberration, which is more of a physical aspect of light. Spherical aberration, we know as we go further out in the lateral extent of a converging lens that we're going to get more converging or refracting power. So we have a blurred image just based upon the system that's inherent. Our human cornea does minimize this somewhat by making the peripheral cornea somewhat flatter to make this image come out to more uh, peripheral location. Diffraction, again, this is pupillary limited. If it's a large pupil, there's going to be very little diffraction of light. As the pupil gets smaller, there's going to be diffraction. So there is certainly a <clears throat> balancing act that we have to obtain, that between a large pupil, which accentuates spherical aberration, and a small pupil, which accentuates diffraction. Chromatic aberration, can we ever treat this or solve this? Uh, I think it's going to be a little bit difficult, but we'll see. The physics system is fairly quick. <clears throat> Wavefront, we can obtain in roughly about 15 seconds the data for the wave map. Um, in a nutshell, what are we looking at? When a photon everts uh, from the macula and go, comes back through the system and picks up by the lens load array, for every two micron deviation or lag in the z-axis, approximately six microns of tissue needs to be removed. So anytime we look at a wavefront map, we need to look at the latency of the photon, which will be color-coded. Blue will be behind and red will be ahead of in the uh, uh, wave prints uh, from the wave scan unit. So let's look at some data. A nice picture, which I'm sure Marguerite has shown you, of very organized and plotted out uh, points that come back through the lens lid array. This is a hyperopic LASIK patient, very mothy. We have to determine what's causing that. Is that truly an abnormal wavefront or is it an abnormal uh, tear film and so forth? This is uh, my mother in law with a PSC cataract. You can see very clearly that the wavefront did not make it back through to the sensing device. We can also see areas where uh, there's a uh, uh, increase in loss of the wavefront right here where there's some anterior cortical spoking. Uh, this is a patient that had RGPs in place pre RGP or RGP in place. We can see that the wavefronts actually look pretty good. You take off the RGP and now we're picking up the keratoconic section of the cornea. Again, a thin piece of cornea, the photon is going to get through that tissue sooner than it is in the thicker piece of cornea. So the red is in front of photon, blue is behind the average photon. <clears throat> this is a uh, the patient that had keratoconus, same patient uh, the previous slide, but this is the eye that had a PKP. If we look at the wavefront, you look at the color code, and again, if this were just colored refrigerator art, you would think this was terrible, but if you look at the scaling, it's 0 0.5 to minus 0 0.5, so there's a relatively short range here. Uh, this patient actually had very good, uh, un or best corrected vision, 20-25 plus. Practical limitations, I think tear film is going to be a limitation in this technology. Again, we're bending light, 66% of the light is bent at the air tear film interface, so if it is affected negatively, I think our data will be questionable and suspect to treat upon. Opacities, if it light can't get back, we can't get good data. Translucencies with irregularity, tissue loss, yes, we can get good data. We do need a decent sized pupil, and obviously you can do the treatment over certain things. Um, this is from Larry Tebos, Indiana University of School of Optometry, where he took patients um, that had good tear film and got a wave print. Looks very nice, very nice and symmetrical. He put alkane in their eyes, did not let them blink for 30 seconds and retest it. You can see degradation of the image getting back to the wavefront device. He has even postulated of using this device in dry eye therapy and to evaluate patients longitudinally. Uh, this is again cataract formation. You see obliteration of the image getting back. This is an a, a asymmetric ablation I created myself, I think from fluid accumulation from a superior hinge flap. This patient needs to be treated. 
I think most of this patient's abnormalities are probably relatively symmetrical because there's not much change when you subtract out the regular sphere and astigmatism, but it would require a custom ablation. Um, what do we do with a regular cornea? We increase spherical aberration. Looking at our Zernike polynomials, this is pre-op minus seven to post-op from uh, Dr. Tebos, we've increased both third and fourth order aberrations. Uh, one thing I think we cannot forget is that we're dealing with a biological system. The lasers we have, we can mold a piece of plastic and do great things, but the biological system is gonna change with time and we need to keep that into consideration. We do need to do these treatments, <clears throat> some specialized tracking, obviously, and calculations that need to be done. Where are we in this spectrum? You know, we want to be up here. We need to go up a lot of steps, but I think we're really at the base of our, our discussion. I just want to show uh, some modeling of uh, this system. I'm actually going to do uh, the 3D, just in the interest of time. If we look at this model, this is a VizX engineer that uh, maybe was a little bit bored, but he looked at his wavefront and then decided to model a treatment with Zernike expansion with the variable scanning uh, spot laser of VizX. The whole idea between the variable spot scanning is that 99% of the tissue removal for a aberrated eye, we're correcting the regular sphere and regular cylinder. One percent of the tissue removal is for correction of the wavefront. If you break that down into pulses, 93 percent of the pulses are for regular sphere, regular astigmatism, and um, seven percent of the pulses are for the wavefront correction. If we look at this in a little bit, little, a slightly different view, we're doing the regular sphere, regular cylinder, and that's going to be the bulk of the treatment. And as we pr come through, you're going to start seeing creation of the wavefront correction toward the very end, where you see that it's not a normal contour. It's more almost like Camelback Mountain down in uh, Arizona. Thank you very much for your attention. Dr. Doan, I'm just uh, wondering, how do you see us discerning in the future when looking at these wavefront analysis um, the internal pathology from the corneal pathology. Uh, very, very good. The one key thing, I think it's a great point uh, Dr. Herzog brings up, is that the depth of the tissue or the depth of the pathology is not present on the waveprint map. You have to go find it as a clinician. You either find it in retinoscopy, slit lamp examination, um, or maybe even you know, frontal topography, looking at placido disc image. You as the surgeon have to find the pathology. The waveprint will not show you that. It will simply show you that the wavefront is abnormal. So I think that's a very important point to take, a, take away from this.